Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our July 28th um, All In for Kansas Kids biweekly webinar. I am Debbie Deer, and I am being joined today by the webinar planning team, Bria Cudney and Hannah McGahey, and we all work for the Kansas Children's Cabinet. Today's meeting, um, or our webinar, I guess, will um, be here to share some general updates and opportunities for you that are available. And the program today will be in two parts. Judy Keller with Keller Consulting will be presenting information on Fundraising 101 and how Kansas um, Child Care Centers can get started. And also Kathy Ediger from Child Care Aware will be sharing out information on the current child care subsidy grants that are available through Child Care Aware in the Kansas Department of Children and Families through the end of this week, uh, July 31st. Some of our general updates uh, we shared with you um, the last time as well. We have a Sunflower Summer program that is sponsored by the Kansas Department of Education. And this is an exciting opportunity for all Kansas families to experience over 70 attractions throughout the state at no cost. So this program runs through the summer until mid-August and is sponsored, as I said, by the Department of Ed. And the app can be downloaded um, by going to this link that's provided here. And uh, we hope that everyone listening in will be able to take advantage of these free and fun activities before the end of the summer. I've already heard some good stories from people that have enjoyed several of the attractions. The Institute for Policy and Social Research is seeking your feedback to identify areas in Kansas that need better internet service. And so we know that access to quality broadband services is a challenge in many Kansas communities. And that easy access is crucial in allowing Kansas families to work from home, to participate in remote learning opportunities, and also to access much needed telehealth services. And so your feedback is valuable in identifying some of the gaps that keep Kansas families from being able to access quality broadband. And so you can go to this link provided here and take a short survey about your internet connection needs and the quality of your services. The Kansas Can uh, Success Tour, sponsored again by the Kansas Department of uh, Education, is scheduled to kick off on July 26th. And so Dr. Randy Watson, the Kansas Commissioner of Education, will be facilitating conversations around the state to get feedback on what your vision for K through 12 education into the future looks like. And so this is a follow up to a similar tour of community conversations that took place in 2015. And so you can visit Kansans Can Tour, oh, sorry, Kansans Can Success Tour to get more information and download flyers and be able to share this out. Once again, your input will be valuable in shaping the future of Kansas education. So please help spread the word. The pandemic P EBT benefits are continuing and this is a financial benefit that is available to families who lost access to uh, their free or reduced price school meals last year during the 2020-21 school year. And so those who missed out on these meals for at least five consecutive days due to their childcare or school being closed or if there were reduced in-person attendance hours, um, those families are eligible to receive these benefits retroactively for last school year. So please share this information out to any families that you might be in communications with. This financial benefit will be very helpful to them who are that are still struggling from the pandemic. And um, they can go to this website for more information. Funding is also available through the Emergency Broadband Benefit, or EBB. 
discounts of up to $50 per month towards cellular and broadband services for eligible households, $75 a month for qualifying households on tribal lands, and up to $100 uh, for the purchase of a laptop, desktop computer, or tablet from participating uh, providers. All of these are available. Again, beneficial to families who are struggling to stay connected during the technology challenges um, and for the very reasons that we previously mentioned. So please visit this website listed for more information. The Hero Relief Child Care Assistance Expansion um, Program is also available. Funds are for working Kansans who make 250% or less of the federal poverty level. And this includes uh, um, also waiving the family share deduction for essential workers, reducing um, deduction for all other workers and expanding the eligibility period from six to 12 months. And to view more information on the details of this program, please visit the website listed here. And I'll give everyone a warning that I just got a notice that my internet is unstable. So if you lose me, <laughs> one of my uh, coworkers might have to jump in. The Kansas Association for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health is sponsoring a reflective supervision consultation training, better known as RSC. And so this opportunity will take place next week on August 3rd and 4th from 9 to 4 each day. And as listed here, reflective supervision is a collaborative effort that fosters professional growth, especially in the areas of program quality, strengths, and partnering around vulnerabilities. And so this training will also provide a better understanding of the impact that RSC has on the infant, early childhood, and family serving workforces. And also we'll explore um, RSC as a strategy in furthering diversity, equity, and inclusion in direct practice and systems. And so scholarships are available and you can go to the link provided here for registration. And you can also email info at kaimh.org with any questions that you might have. There is one ASQ SE2 training left that's available uh, through the Kansas Department of Education. It's being held tomorrow from 1 to 4, uh, July 29th, and registration is available at this link provided. And this training is designed for any professional who has contact with children younger than 72 months of age. And the goal of the ASQ SE2 training is to identify social or emotional difficulties early, which then allows families and children to receive services as soon as the difficulty is recognized. And with that, that is all of our um, general updates for you. We hope that you will find many of those helpful and um, also be able to share out that information with throughout your child, early childhood networks. And so now I am pleased to introduce uh, part one of our program today, um, Judy Keller, the president of Keller Consulting um, to present on Fundraising 101. So welcome, Judy. Thank you, Debbie. And welcome everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I know you've heard of a number of um, federal or state opportunities, but what we're going to in grant writing and our firm certainly does grant writing. We've done that for some of the agencies on this call. Um, but for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about a different kind of fundraising, grassroots, at home, in your backyard, contact sport fundraising. And uh, I would appreciate it if, uh, if you would just take yourself off mute, even put yourself on video for just a few minutes and fully participate with me as we go through about 20 minutes of, thank you, I see people popping on, that's awesome. This is a contact sport. So we need you to be part of this conversation in the next 20 minutes or so. We're gonna talk about um, private fundraising from individuals, from local businesses, from corporations that may be in your community, but 
how to get started and think about fundraising. And I believe Hannah is advancing slides for me. Thank you. So we've been asked to talk about the principles of fundraising, talk about how you can get started and then help you identify maybe your top three next action items. What is it that you would like to accomplish in the next few minutes? Either use the chat or just speak up. Do you have specific questions about how to get started in fundraising? Mary Loftus, my colleague is watching the chat, so she'll chime in. I know she'll, she'll come off mute and she'll chime in if, um, as we get questions in the chat. Um, Judy, question. I have a question. Sure. I have a question. And, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And I see I, one I, from Kim. Okay, well, I'm go ahead with Kim's. I, okay, Kim, go first. Well, Kim, you want to ask your question or shall I read it? Um, I'll go ahead and ask. Um, okay. Kind of questioning what do we need to have in place before we can effectively fundraise? So we know we're doing that in a way that will be most successful. Great question. And I saw Rich popped, uh, Rich Minder, who I've known forever since I live in Lawrence, um, also asked about motivating board members. And trust me, that can be and is a full day uh, seminar all by itself. So just in the few minutes we have, um, we'll, we'll touch on some of the highlights, but know that there's so much more and you're welcome to contact us after this presentation if you'd like to um, talk about something specific that's on your mind. So what are the things you have to have in place? Well, that's exactly where we're headed. And Hannah, uh, next slide. Think about first why we're even raising money. What is it that you want to raise money for? And why, um, why you're even considering it, whether it's a new playground in your facility or you'd like to have um, more field trips for your kiddos, whatever it is, I think it's really important that we know why we're raising money. And you'd be surprised, we work with Mary and I work with organizations of all sizes. And um, sometimes it's not very clear exactly why we're raising the money. You want to raise money, I'm assuming, because your community needs you. Yes, you're a business, but first and foremost, you are a service. And I had three daughters that went through daycare. Um, so I know firsthand what a critical service you are uh, to the community. Um, that you're serving. People want to do good. They want to be able to help you. There's all kinds of social science research out there that shows uh, giving is good for you. It's good for your health and people want to support you. Actually, two thirds of America um, uh, does give to charity of one sort or another. And finally, we say you wanna build relationships with potential donors, not just for your immediate fundraising goal, but for the long term, because it may be a playground today, but it may be field trips tomorrow, right? So you want to build relationships with your donors, not just for an individual project, um, but over the long haul. You want them to know and support what you do. So what is it you want to do? Are you raising a million dollars for a brand new facility? Or are you raising $5,000 so um, you can have field trips? Give us a few ideas, either in the chat or um, speaking up. What is it that you want to raise money for? <clears throat> Am I right? Would field trips be one? Would playgrounds be another? What are some other ideas? More staff, so you can take more kids. Do you need to scale up because there's a need in your community? Um, Judy? I see, I see Reva is mentioning facility yes. renovation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And Reva, I, we know that since you and Mary have been working together. Uh, facility renovation is a major issue. And you know we go down two tracks. If you are a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation, then um, we urge you to contact us and we'll have a 
whole conversation about your specific facility needs. Um, if you are not a 501c3, you're not off the hook. You can still ask for funds. You just can't legally give a, um, uh, it's not a charitable donation for the donor. But there are organizations out there, in fact, some early childhood centers that are not 501c3s that routinely have runs and walks and special events to support their activities. Debbie needs a new bus or a new van or knows someone who does. Good. Those are all the big dreams that, that really focus us. And you know, to your earlier question of what do we have to have in place, I would say we have to have a compelling need. We have to have a, a case for support in the development jargon, right? You have to have a focus, um, a goal, not just a financial goal, but a bus or facilities. Those are the kinds of um, um, initial questions that frame what you're going to do and how you're going to raise money. Hannah? So what is holding you back? If assuming you know what your goal is, what it is that you need for your facility, um, what's holding you back? Maybe reluctance, maybe you don't like asking for money. We hear that all the time. And we've worked with lots of volunteers who start a project by saying, I'll do anything for you uh, in fundraising. I just don't wanna ask anyone for money. And they usually end by saying that wasn't so bad because it really wasn't about the money. It was about the bus or the van, um, the facilities. And no, not even then, uh, it's about the kids. And you all have the most compelling mission of any mission I can think of because you're working for kids and helping build the future of a strong, bright, healthy Kansas. Let's turn the tables for a minute and think like a donor. And I think that's very important. Again, coming back to what do we have to have in place? You need to have, you need to think like a donor. You need to be a donor. What is it about your project that motivates you to give? And what is it that maybe is a question that still needs to be answered, right? Everyone on this call has a charitable heart or you wouldn't be in the work you're in. So think about what motivates you to give. Honesty, a compelling need, a realistic goal, a worthy mission. Those are all reasons that I give to organizations. And I would hope and, and think maybe your reasons for giving are similar. Knowing I'll have an impact. Thank you, Kim. In fact, um, wealthy donors are annually polled. We have a, a national survey that's done among the most wealthy donors. And that remains the number one reason that people give to nonprofit organizations. They want to make a difference. And surely in your community, um, people can see making a difference for kids in Kansas. Um, that's that's what it comes down to, right? Let's and, go ahead and from, to the next slide. From Linda, making a difference for children. Yes, for kids, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, you know, Mary and I have been in this work a very long time and some um, uh, target audiences, if you will, are frankly easier to raise money for than others. And you all have a great group. People love kids and they want to give to kids. And um, that can be harder than raising money for the, for example, the Colitis Foundation. <laughs> uh, it's not about the money. It never is. Uh, people give because they want to help. They want to know what the need is. They want to know that their gift will make a difference, just like you do. And in fact, I was just reading a um, report released this week that confirms the social science behind um, giving. Tests were done. There were two huge ma um, direct mail tests done. One showed numbers and statistics. In our case, number of children served in the abstract, more of an, um, a data-driven appeal. And one 
took the story of one child and told how the gift would make a difference. And the results were overwhelmingly um, um, more productive in the case where one child's story was told. So in terms of what you need to get started, think about your goal. Think about one child that will be impacted by that goal. And then think about how to tell that story in a way that would resonate with you as a donor. Convince yourself to donate and you'll be well on your way to convincing other people to do the same thing. Really, you're not asking for money. You're giving them an opportunity to join you in helping children like the child whose example you give, right? It's all about how you tell your story. So here are some um, easy tips to get started. First of all, crowdfunding. Everyone's seen it. Everyone has a Facebook page. You can do a uh, very simple, small crowdfunding on Facebook or um, whatever your favorite platform is, Instagram. Um, birthday requests are pretty common on Facebook. And start small. You know, it's easy to, it's, it's, fun to celebrate success. It's easier to celebrate success. You want to be known as a successful organization. So put something up for your birthday and ask for $200 or $100 or maybe new books for your um, early childhood center. Something easy that is not going to feel overwhelming for you and then uh, celebrate that success. And again, you don't have to be a 501c3. Um, that's only um, uh, in terms of, of the tax deduction for the donor. Um, but I get these things all the time and I'll give $25. It doesn't matter whether or not I get a tax advantage in that, right? So consider crowdfunding. Call on your community. Uh, we want to Think about, so now we know what we're raising money for. We can tell our story about how it's going to impact one of our children, one of our kids, or maybe one of our families. And we're willing to give ourselves. We know we're being transparent. Um, now think about who you can ask. Businesses in the community, parents. Uh, parents don't have a lot of money generally, but that's okay. 100% participation, you know, a dollar, five dollars from each family member is a huge uh, voice of support and a great way to get started. If you have 20 children in your center and each family gives five dollars, you can then go out to your local businesses and say, my parents don't have a lot of funds, but 100% of them are committed to this goal because they know we need a new van or they know we need new playground equipment. Will you match what they did? Will you give $100 and match what they did? Um, so start with the people you know. Fundraising is really all about relationships. Got to have a target. It's good to know what we're raising the money for. I think I've mentioned that early on in terms of what the item is. But it's also true, uh, it's helpful to have a financial target and one you can celebrate. So think about once you get to 100%, all your parents have given, maybe an ice cream social or, um, uh, well, that's the easiest thing I can think of, right? Have everyone stay for ice cream and celebrate that you got to 100%. Have a target in mind and make it realistic. Food is a great, great motivator. It is for early childhood centers and kids in the summertime, but I'll tell you what, it is for very wealthy donors in large, fancy country clubs. Food works for all of us. So think about what you can do to keep your event or um, your celebration uh, happy. And that usually includes dessert of some sort, right? <laughs> My, um, I was the president of uh, PTA at my children's elementary school for years. 
And we had a lot of events and it was a fundraiser for all our scholarships and all our field trips for kids that needed a little extra help. Um, but it was also a great community gathering. And even in the age of COVID, we can do that outside. And we can do that um, for in the foreseeable future, right? Fall is gonna be beautiful with or without masks. We can start to gather now. So take advantage of that, of the time of year. Um, and then lastly, you can't say thank you enough and you've got to mean it. You know, I've been in situations where um, development officers say thank you, but it feels a little patronizing or it feels a little um, disingenuine. You've just got to be who you are. You've got to be authentic. Say thank you and mean it. And you can do that with a handwritten thank you note. You can do that in person. You can do that by baking someone uh, a cake or, um, you know, having a car wash and then um, having a celebration afterwards. Just real grassroots stuff that you see that um, lets your community know that you also have needs as an organization and you are also in the game of uh, raising money. You've got to be prompt. All the research shows that uh, the most, the best way to keep someone as a second time donor, as a second year donor, is to thank them within the first 72 hours and to let them know how their gift will be used. So if you're raising money for facilities, doesn't matter what the size of the gift is, thank them right away and let them know that that gift um, helped you launch your campaign. It's a little more complicated when we're raising millions of dollars for a capital campaign, but it's always important to say thank you and let people know how the gift is being used. And yes, handwritten thank you notes are still um, platinum in terms of, of how to say thank you. And yes, absolutely, Debbie, getting kids to write thank you notes or draw pictures of the gift is huge. Um, you're also able to give tours. You know, the Colitis Foundation can't give tours. You can give <laughs> tours. And that, it, uh, we worked on a $14 million campaign for an early childhood center in Kansas City, um, just over the state line on the Missouri side. And uh, the CEO was just phenomenal at giving tours. They weren't long, uh, they weren't lengthy, uh, they weren't full of jargon, but donors left every time seeing exactly how their funds were gonna make a difference. So if you can bring someone through, if you can have them drive by and see your kiddos in the backyard um, and get out for five or 10 minutes at your convenience, at their convenience, that can make all the difference. That can really bring in thousands. I've seen it work. You can bring in thousands of dollars just by allowing your prospective donors to be with your kids and see your kids, obviously in a safe space. I think my overall advice to you, regardless of how much you're trying to raise and for what purpose, um, is to really embrace the part of this that is fun. And in my experience, that means focusing on the kids and what you're raising the money for and not on the money. Don't focus on the money. It will come. If you truly enjoy what you're doing and you put some energy in it, it's contagious and donors sense that. Here's what not to do. We work with a lot of libraries and uh, schools and this cartoon is um, one that I really like. I've also had my children at the library a lot. So this one resonates, I think, for a lot of us that, that have kids and, and have their kids spending time in the library. Uh, don't go negative, right? That's a double negative itself. Stay positive, keep it fun, and um, don't think about the money as much as the kids and what you're trying to raise money for. All right, now let's really take it off mute or uh, Mary is monitoring the chat for me because I can't do two things at once. 
So she may have some questions that are already in the chat um, or just go ahead and chime in if you have a question or a comment. Judy, there was a question earlier about money to provide families with concrete supports in time of need, which may be a little more difficult than a playground or something that is, is concrete. An emergency fund, you know, emergency assistance funds, again, are seen in crowdfunding a lot. Um, even before the pandemic, we were seeing more and more of that. Uh, and it's a great example of an emotional appeal, especially if it's a family that is in your center and you need, and you know that family is having rough time uh, for whatever reason. Um, we have to be tasteful with it, but I think it can be very compelling. It depends what the specific situation is. It may be rent assistance, it may be medical assistance, and some of that individual support funding is available through larger mechanisms. So you can raise money for um, uh, an emergency fund in general, it's gonna be much more compelling if you're able to identify someone with a specific need who's willing to share their story. So the follow-up, is it better to raise funds for specific families rather than a general fund? And maybe the story is anonymous? It can be anonymous. It can be you know someone in our center Oh, give me an example. We have a fam, you wouldn't have to use names because you certainly want to respect privacy. But if they're willing, you could say a family in our center um, is experiencing difficult, is experiencing temporary unemployment and needs some help with rent assistance. So we're launching an emergency fund for this family and other families that may be in need. Absolutely, you can do that, absolutely. So how do we engage those who don't have children to uh, support early child, the early childhood community? Great question. You are in charge of the future of your community. I fully believe that. I know it to be true, having had three daughters go through early childhood centers. So you have a compelling case to make to anyone that lives in your community. Fundraising is at its essence about relationships and it is local. So we start with your community. We start not only with your parent groups and your staff, but then we go to your grandparents. And we've had some very successful grandparents campaigns for schools in the past. Um, but you are, you are responsible for the future, in part responsible for the future of your community. And every business person in that community, every member of that community um, needs an opportunity to support what you're doing. Now, they may not all say yes. If they say no, that's fine. You move on. There's nothing personal about it. Um, but you want to give them the opportunity to help you build a stronger community, right? I've spent a lot of time in Garden City um, where I helped build a public radio station and spent almost 10 years there and still have family there. And I know the Russell Child Development Center there is a great example of a whole lot of people in the community coming together to support um, children in their uh, throughout Southwest Kansas, not just not just uh, Garden City, but throughout Southwest Kansas. So there are lots and lots of examples of um, really making it a community wide campaign. Judy, what types of projects are donors most likely to give to in a child care setting? Any themes you could identify? Sure. Well, there certainly are foundations that focus on youth. And Mary, you know, as my colleague, when we work with an organization, 
um, one of the first things we do is a prospective donor search. And we will go through all the databases to find any foundations in your market that have an interest in youth. So there's that, right, in foundations. For businesses, I would look at businesses that, um, that are local and that have um, a corporate interest. It's called cause-related marketing in the jargon, right? They have an interest in children. They're either selling toys or they're selling fast food or they are otherwise um, trying to connect to youth in the market. Um, so that's businesses. And then for individuals, I would probably focus on anyone that has already given to a youth entity or organization in your community. And you know, a lot of this information is public. When we come into a town, we do a, a pretty analytical and, and structured search, but you can do it just on a walk, right? Go to the library and look at the donor wall. Um, uh, look at who funds your local community theater. If it's a youth theater program, look at who's supporting that. This information is all public. A lot of it is public. And I would look at the people that are already supporting youth-related activities. Statistically, two-thirds of America gives. And most people that give, give to between five and seven charities. Now, they're not all giving the same amount. And when we do larger campaigns, we want your organization to be one of the top three charities. We want to get one of those larger gifts. But you got to start where you are. So if someone gave to a youth organization, um, the chances are they're going to say yes to you. Judy, I don't think we ever um, addressed the question of motivating board members. Yeah, Rich, we should talk offline or have a whole separate at least hour <laughs> on board members. In fact, we have given presentations around board members and, um, and we, I'm happy to have that conversation. I'm not sure I can do it within the confines of, of the time we have today. Um, do you, do you ever um, present to board members about their role and giving them strategies for how to make the ask when they're uncomfortable? We often present to board members. And when we're doing a capital campaign, a lot of what we're doing is informal training. I don't like the word training because I want to respect the fact that these are the folks that govern the organization. They're not dogs to be trained, right? I need to train my dog, but I don't train board members. But I do present best practices in fundraising and I do walk alongside them to increase their comfort level with the whole process of fundraising. So it's informal training. Um, we start where they are, simple, non-threatening ways to get board members engaged in fundraising include just having them write thank you notes, you know, and no, they can't just email. Everyone wants to live through email because it's easy. No, they need to sit down. They can do it together with some music going and some coffee or wine or whatever their beverage of choice is, but they need to sit down and write handwritten thank you notes. And it's better if they know who they're writing to. So we give them a list and they pick off names of people they know, but it's also okay to have them um, all sign a thank you note. Um, so that's a non-threatening kind of early, early way to get board members started. They, the next step is for them to pick up the phone and just generally leave a message on voicemail Hi, this is Rich and I'm on the board and um, I just wanted to give you a call and thank you. I know you have a lot of, I know there are a lot of great organizations in town and we really appreciate the $20 you sent uh, to us. So um, I'm just calling as a board member. Those are pretty simple ways. If someone can't even do that, I would want to think about what assets they are bringing to the board. 
and whether or not we have term limits. And we do work with organizations around board development. Uh, and I mean that in all sincerity, I would say that to board members, have said that to board members too. Um, and all the research supports it. You know, there's a great um, resource for any of you that are 501c3s called boardsource.com. And it has a lot of one page ex uh, executive summaries on best practices. And uh, they have one on best practices for boards. Um, so sometimes we, our assignment is to work with an organization to um, uh, transition the board into a more active fundraising board. Sometimes you have to build a whole new board. So it's not a board, it's a steering committee for a capital campaign, right? And they're the ones that know at the outset they're responsible for raising money. And they may not be the same people that are on your board. I could deliver a feasibility study report tomorrow to a hospital foundation board. And everyone in town is on board for a $2 million campaign, except the board. <laughs> so we're gonna create a steering committee that does the fundraising. And Rich, I'd be happy to talk more later if you like. And I from- more, I don't want to steal too much time. We're at 12.42. Debbie, are we okay to take one more question? One um, more? Linda's asking what tips you might have to suggest for someone wanting to start a new child care center or family child care home. You know, our... As Keller Consulting, our expertise really is um, not fundraising, strategic planning for nonprofit organizations. So if you're a 501, if you plan to be a 501c3, I'm happy to talk to you offline. Um, uh, more questions than answers leap to mind. I would need to know a lot more. If you're not a 501c3, I can talk to you in general, but I would urge you to think through the business plan of, you know, the financial business plan of either model. And in any event, my number one suggestion is that you work with the great folks at, uh, on this call at KU and at the state who are committed to supporting early childhood centers. None, no one should have to do this from scratch because there are great resources out there. Um, and the 65 people on this call, 63 people on this call know a lot more about early childhood specifically than Mary or I do. Um, but if you wanna talk about nonprofit startups, then please give us a call offline. Again, thank you for the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. I understand we're gonna be coming back in a few weeks to focus on grant writing. So um, think of your questions, feel free to pass them along. You can find us online at kellerconsulting.com. Uh, Mary and I have, are lifelong Kansans, almost lifelong now, I guess. I've been raising money in Kansas and living here for 35 years. and. Uh, all over the state and um, are just so appreciative of the work that you're doing to keep our kids healthy and safe. And um, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you, Judy and Mary for being here and providing that information. Um, from my fundraising experiences, it can be very intimidating in the beginning. So just getting some of those tips is hopefully gonna be helpful to those listening in today. So we are now going to move on to the next uh, segment of our uh, program, which is Child Care Sustainability Grants. And we have Kathy Ediger from Child Care Aware, who is going to be explaining those and uh, answering questions that you might have. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing us to come on and briefly um, talk about um, the sustainability grant that we have going on um, at the moment. Um, so what are 
the sustainability grants. Um, they are a program that is awarded through the Kansas Department of Children and Families, and it is distributed through um, Child Care Aware of Kansas. Um, what it provides is funding to cover costs for operations and potential revenue losses to child care providers. Um, so these funds can be used for um, normal operation expenses or additional expenses occurred to meet um, CDC guidance to mitigate the spread of COVID, or it can be um, expenses for other activities necessary to maintain or reserve, uh, excuse me, resume the operations of programs, including um, fixed costs and increases in operational expenses. Um, th thank you. Um, so who is eligible? So all um, Kansas, uh, licensed Kansas providers are uh, eligible. Um, they must be in sustainable compliance and um, KDHE did um, provide a definition of what that means for us. And I'll read that to you. Um, so it's a program that does not have a pending or open administrative order due to non-compliance or a program that is not operating under a consent agreement. And then programs that most recent annual and compliance surveys were closed as in compliance and there have not been any substantiated complaints when the, in the past 12 months. Next, thank you. Um, so what, that, what this covers, um, there are several categories that the expenses um, are covered. Um, I'll read some of them to you. Um, so salaries, food, contractual services, equipment and maintenance, office classroom supplies, professional development, minor innovations, licensing fees, advertising and software, employment taxes, self-employment tax and fringe benefits, cleaning and sanitation supplies and personal protective equipment, rent mortgage utilities, telephone internet, mileage, liability and accident insurance. So there's a wide range of things that this grant um, is covering, um, which was in our hopes that it can uh, reach programs with as little as 10 kids, clear up to the kids that have the programs that have 200 and everyone in between. Um, we do have uh, definitions on our website if you need to go more clarification for what some of those categories really entail. Um, so those expenses also, um, the nice thing about this grant is that it allows programs to go back clear to March 1st of 2020 going forward to January 31st, 2022. So 23 months that these programs can find expenses that they've already paid for or things that they know are coming up. So it's a big range um, to find some of these um, expenses that um, have maybe put a burden on their program. Um, so the um, payment and, and what can be awarded. So all, all child care programs, again, that are licensed in um, Kansas that do meet the eligibility requirements, we have broken down. And um, so family, group, child care homes can get $5,000. And then other child care programs such as child care centers, preschools, Head Starts, um, school age programs and drop-in care are based on their licensed capacity. So licensed capacity of 24 or less children receive $10,000. Licensed capacity between 25 to 99 children, 30,000 and licensed capacity of 100 plus children receive $60,000. These payments are broken down into three equal monthly payments. First one starting um, in August, September, and then October. Thank you. Um, so we have some important dates. Um, one, this application opened July 1st of 2021, and it closes at 5 p.m. on July 31st, 2021, which is this Saturday. 
So if your program or you know of a program that has not um, applied, I really encourage you to um, tell them to imply, apply and that it, the deadline is quickly approaching. Um, some other dates are the dates for the um, payments. So in August, we have 16th, the 16th or the 30th, which means if their program applied and um, was accepted before the 15th, of July, they will get that first payment on the 16th. If it's afterwards, it'll come on the 30th. And then after that, it's September 30th, 2021 and October 29th, 2021. So that is a really brief over, overview of, um, of the program. And, and I do invite you if you do have additional need questions answered to visit our website or you may email us at the grants team um, at grants.kansas.childcareaware.org. Um, or if you have questions here that I can um, answer, I'm more than happy to try to answer some of those questions for you. The big thing is, is to remember that that deadline is quickly approaching and we want to reach as many programs as possible. So if you do know of someone that hasn't applied, um, either give them ARMA information to contact us or urge them to apply online. Are there any questions for me? Kathy, I'm not seeing or hearing any questions right now. So you must have covered everything very thoroughly. <laughs> thank you. And uh, uh, thank I, you. Thank you for being here and explaining that. And again, I'm going to echo what you said as far as the deadline is Saturday, five o'clock PM. We encourage um, anyone to either apply or to share this information with someone that they know, a provider who may apply. These funds are going to be very helpful helpful to many providers throughout Kansas to in, enhance their programs. So yes. thank you for being here with thank us you. today. So to wrap up our meeting or our webinar today, um, we just have some reminders of meetings that are coming up. The next early childhood recommendations panel meeting will be on the morning of August 20th. Those happen on the third Friday of every month from 9 to 1130. You can join us on YouTube uh, to view those or go to the cabinet website at any time to um, see those after they've happened. Uh, our next biweekly webinar here uh, will be Wednesday, August 11th. So we hope that all of you will consider coming back and joining us uh, that day as well. And also, if you ever have any topics that you are interested in hearing about or you have a program that you want to share with us, then we hope that you will reach out to us so that we can um, get that information and, and talk to you about that. Our next cabinet and stakeholder group meeting is going to happen on Friday, August the 6th. And those are in uh, cabinet in the morning from nine to noon, stakeholder group meeting in the afternoon from one to 3.30. And we also always welcome you to share feedback of any kind that you might have on our Kansas Children's Cabinet website at the link that Bria has put in the chat here. So, Thank you to everyone for joining us. We have had a full hour of information and we hope that it's been, uh, you'll find it helpful, either the opportunities to apply for funding or um, just the information on how to fundraise and uh, contact the people that were here with us if you have any further questions. And so I always like to leave you with a final thought. And today I'm thinking about you and we all need to think about ourselves. I was just having a conversation yesterday about this is a really busy time of the year for a lot of us. If you work within a program, you're getting ready to kick off your new school year or your preschool. Um, you've got kids that need school supplies and school shopping and uh, just trying to wrap up a lot of summer activities. And not to mention the fact that it's really hot outside right now. And so uh, we want you to put yourselves first. So I wanna leave you with put yourself at the top of your to-do list every single day and the rest will fall in place. 
And I know that that's easier said than done, but we hope that uh, you are all able to make yourselves a priority uh, throughout the day at some point in time and take care of you. So we thank you for joining us and we hope to see you back here again in two weeks. Have a great rest of your day.